Okay, folks, Twitter kerfuffles are the best kerfuffles, and I got into one today dealing with the question of ISOM number one. Did people buy it on hope or quality? All right, I need to tell you a story first, so bear with me. Uh, once upon a time, I was on an airplane, and I did not want to pay the $2 for the headphones. So they were playing the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen during the in as the in-flight movie. And I, you know, I was watching it with the sound off, and as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, man, this movie looks really good. I mean, everything that I'm seeing here as far as the cinematography goes, the special effects how the characters look like they're interplaying, because, you know, I can't hear any dialogue or anything. But it all looked really, really good. So uh, when I got off the plane, I was thinking, you know, man, that's going to be really cool someday when, I he when I'm able to actually watch it on TV and see it with dialogue, you know? So uh, years passed, because, you know, in flight movie, I guess it had only been recently released in theaters. And uh, finally, one day it did show up on TV, probably FX or someplace, and uh, I got to watch The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen with the sound, with the dialogue, with all of the, the writing that the, the writers had put into it, the screenwriters and such. And oh my god, that movie sucked. Oh, it was terrible. I mean, it was such a brilliant concept, but when you actually put the dialogue and the other writing in, it was terrible. You know, it, 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 be, it made the movie irredeemable in my eyes. So one of the things I learned from this experience is that unless you have the full experience of a movie, you can't just judge the movie by one facet of it. You can't just judge it by its video presence. You have to have the sound and the, the speech and the narration and all of that too. Otherwise, you've only got half of a, half of a product. And you can't judge anything when you haven't been exposed to it in all of its elements. So, moving on to the topic of the Ripiverse. Kevin Grievous to kick off Black History Month. And before I get into this at all, Kevin Grievous um, created a character called the Blue Marvel. Uh, Dr. Adam Brazier, who was black, and because he was black, he was forced to go underground rather than be a superhero in the early days of Marvel Comics. And uh, so he came out with this uh, five-issue miniseries, Adam, Legend of the Blue Marvel, and it was collected into a single volume, but this volume has not been reprinted since the first printing. Is, is there somebody who can tell me why this book has not been reprinted? Because this is the last hole that is missing, that, that is open in my collection. I've got a hole in my collection, and it's shaped exactly like this book. I remember years ago, I, I saw it with a little neon green sign on it that said, uh, neon green sticker saying $9.99, half price, get it now. And I, I passed it by. You know, I didn't know that he was going to be an important character in the Ultimate series years later. So, you know, now I want to go back and get this so that I've got this in my hot little hands. And the only thing I can find are digital copies. I mean, they have digital copies for generally five bucks. And if it's Black History Month, they might lower the price to zero dollars. So uh, be on the watch for that. But I want to actually have a copy of this in my hands, and I don't know how to get one. It's too expensive out there. They sell for like $100 or more. Um, I just want a new printing. What the hell's wrong with Marvel? Okay, enough of my bitching about that. So Kevin Grievous on February 1st, kicking off Black History Month, uh, put out this tweet saying, Great comic creators in American history. Eric July of the Ripiverse creates ISOM. Black History Month. Black superheroes. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit ironic considering I think Eric would probably be kind of like, do we have to do the blackity black thing? But at the same time, yeah, it's not his tweet. But a couple of days later, Mr. Grievous went a little bit too far for me. He said, here's what people are really missing about Eric July. Behind Stan Lee, Bob Kane, the Image Founders, Robert Kirkman, and Mark Miller, he is among the most successful comic creators in history. He generated $3.7 on his first outing with one book. 
there should be zero scorn. Okay, you had me up until there should be zero scorn. And the reason for that is because it makes it sound as though he created a great product. Just as we know that Stan Lee, Bob Kane, the Image Founders, Robert Kirkman, and Mark Miller have all created great products. But is that really the case? I've bought, I've read ISOM number one. I was not as impressed with it as I could have been. I'm trying to be generous here because it was, uh, uh, it was just not worth the money. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't get beyond that. And so when Kevin Grievous says there should be zero scorn, and he's kind of connecting this $3.7 million on his first outing with one book, it makes it sound as if that book should put him on par with Stan Lee or Bob Kane or the Image Founders or Robert Kirkman and Mark Millar, and it's just not true. But but wait, didn't it didn't it earn three point seven million dollars? I mean, doesn't that mean something? Does that mean it was a good book? Well, you got to look at the sequence of events. Here is how ISOM Number One's campaign transpired. Number one, ISOM number one campaign opens with a story blurb and preview material. So we got a story blurb basically saying, here's what's going to be in the book, generally speaking. You know, it's the story of Avery Simmons, or sorry, I keep getting that wrong. Avery Silman, a rancher. Uh, he used to be a superhero, but he quit. And now he's going back into the town that he left because he has to look for a friend of his sister's and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so that's the story blurb. And then there's preview material. Well, the preview materials consisted of unlettered pages only. So you had these three pages on the website selling ISOM number one, and none of them had any dialogue. None of them have any captions. None of them have any examples of what the writing in the book is going to look like. And so... The next thing that happens is the campaign earns $3.7 million. And that's without people seeing, having seen anything about what the writing is going to look like. Okay, so this is kind of the equivalent to my having seen League of Extraordinary Gentlemen with the sound off. You, you don't know what it's going to sound like when you put the words in here. So the campaign earns $3.7 million, fulfillment begins after the close of the campaign, and then lettered pages from ISOM number one start showing up online. And it is at this point, it is the first point at which people get exposed to the writing in ISOM number one, which is well after all of that $3.7 million has been collected, okay? So what I said in reply to Kevin Grievous was, except his revenue has nothing to do with the quality of the book, which was bought sight unseen, except for covers, three to four unlettered pages, and a story blurb. His revenue has everything to do with converting 7% of a 500,000 YouTube base willing to pay on hope. Now I got a response, and now I, immediately there were people who misunderstood what it was I was talking about. Like, for example, you got this one guy, wouldn't you like to know, who said, well, the fact that they didn't reveal too much too soon made it interesting. You may want all the answers in the first book, but I like surprises. So he's already gotten me wrong about what it is I'm complaining about. I'm not complaining about the fact that things like Isom's origin are not in the book. In fact, I pointed out at one point that Batman is another character whose first appearance was separated from a number of, by a number of issues from his origin story. So this is nothing new. I mean, the fact that Isom's number one issue doesn't have his origin story is nothing new. It goes all the way back to the 1940s. But, um, you know, there are people who complained about that. I am not one of them. Uh, the things that they didn't reveal in the book that, you know, hopefully will be revealed over time, I don't have any problem with that at all. So I put back, uh, so, so I had another person who uh, responded saying, well, let us know when any medium, books, movies, video games, start spoiling their entire story before they're even sold. I'm not asking for the entire story to be, to, to, to be spoiled. 
I'm only asking for a sample of the writing so that I can know from what I'm reading how it's going to sound. Is it going to be good writing or not? I'm seeing the pictures. I'm not hearing the words. Okay, I want to hear those words in my head. I want to see what he's written before I pick this book up. So I replied to them. I said, that's not at all what I'm talking about. Is I saw number one a well-written book? Before people started posting interiors from the copies they'd received, nobody could know. And it was only after I saw some of these interiors from somebody on Twitter who had posted them there that I said, okay, yeah, I'm going to plunk down. But by that point, he had already had his campaign. He had already collected that $3.7 million, and those, that $3.7 million was paid by people who could do no more than hope that the book was well written. So, next person to complain uh, at me says, local comic shops order books sight unseen every month using that exact formula. A cover, three to four pages, and a blurb. Most creators, okay, so that's, that's one point, but does that tell you whether the book is any good? And then the other thing was, most creators leverage their social media platforms to promote. Not sure why these metrics are used to drag Eric. I'm not dragging him about it. I mean, hey, if you can leverage 7% of a 500 person or 500,000 person audience, more power to you. Leverage 25%, leverage 50%, leverage all of them. My god, I'm not I'm not saying that you don't want to use your YouTube audience to make money. I'm just saying that has no relationship between that and the quality of the book. So I said does how much local comic shops order indicate whether or not the book is any good? How many times did a book come into your local comic shop on big hype and you found out at home it was garbage? Oh my god, that's happened to me more times than I can count. Now, I'm not dragging Eric for using his fan base, just don't confuse his fan base with quality. Next, I have a person saying, that's one of the worst excuses for undermining hard work and success that I've seen in years. You're delusional. Ah, I'm not, I, did I say anything about hard work, for one thing? Did I, did I say anything complaining about the success itself? I'm not undermining anything. I'm saying the quality of the book isn't what brought in the revenue. And that's just a fact. Nobody could even judge whether ISOM number one was a well-written book or not until they had a copy in their hands, which happened after all the money had come in, okay? So until you've got a writing sample in your hands, you know, there's nothing, you can't judge. You just can't judge. You literally just described how comic previews work. I mean, oh my God, seriously? So I, I told the guy, really? Because if you go to Bleeding Cool, which is a website that review, that put, posts up uh, comic book previews, most of the previews there are lettered to give you an indication of whether the writing is any good. We didn't get that with ISOM number one. It took people showing us interior pages from their copies to get a glimpse. That was after the $3.7 million had come in. Okay, so I'm saying really here, it's like, that's not how they all work. I mean, some comic book previews, sure. I've seen comic book previews where they didn't give letters. I ignore those because why the hell would you want an incomplete preview of the book? I mean, that, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you whether it's going to be a well-written comic to see just pictures. So those kinds of previews are useless to me. Like here's an example from Bleeding Cool. This is a page from uh, Daredevil number eight. And so here you have an example of a lettered preview that's been distributed by Marvel through Bleeding Cool. Now, this is where Eric July jumps in and things start getting interesting. He says first, in his usual deprecating way, you don't at all seem familiar with this industry. Dude, you're 32, I'm 50. I've been collecting comics when you were collecting shit in your diaper, all right? God, you don't have to be a patronizing asshole when you're talking to people who disagree with you. Most previews don't have letters. Really? Okay. Well, all of the ones that I've been reading have had letters. Why? Because I'm on a site that publishes lettered previews. Here's an example of Marvel announcing the debut of this new Warlock. Not only are the preview pages not lettered, they're not colored either. As if this is any kind of argument. You know what? 
That's not good enough to tell you whether the book is quality. Because even if the pics look good, the writing could be crap. Just like with the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. That's why I never go by unlettered previews. Anyone who does is either hopeful or doesn't care about good writing. And then I said thanks for the assist because he's pretty much making my point for me. Well, you can do what you want. This is about the comic book industry and your response. You attempt, attempted to single out our approach as if it was abnormal, oddly referencing Bleeding Cool, because they're the site that I read, when nearly the entire mainstream industry does the exact same. Now, I nowhere said that the approach was abnormal. Unlettered previews could be the industry standard for all I care. But that still cannot communicate the quality of the book's writing. Because it literally can't. There, there's no writing communicated in there. And I reference Bleeding Cool because I read Bleeding Cool. And then, dude, you literally spot, respond in confusion when someone told you that's how the industry previews work. Now, can I help it that he doesn't interpret my sarcastic really properly and he interprets it as a confused really? Also, and I love this part, quit simply saying writing. You're referring to dialogue. Writers of comic books also write the labels, and they are just as much part of the writing. <laughs> Look, you're not giving me shit of any kind of writing, all right? I understand that writing is a super category that is above dialogue, but then there's captions at the same time, and there's probably other, other subcategories as well. Like, uh, you know, responding to letters to the editor and things like that. So I'm basically telling him I'm not confused. I just read lettered previews more than you do. You know, he's used to the unlettered kind. And maybe he buys his comics based off of that. I will never settle for anything less than a lettered preview. And yes, I am referring to dialogue, which is a subcategory of writing, which is also a super category to captions, as everyone already knows. Thank you, Mr bigger nitpicker than I am when uh, than I am when it's not your work reviewed. I mean seriously, this is a guy who accuses me of nitpicking and then he is splitting this hair saying, "Well, you keep saying writing, but what you mean is dialogue." As if that's not the same fucking category. Uh. But you said, "Really?" You know, because there's only ever one way to interpret how someone says really. The standard, and it's been this way for the industry for a very long time, is showing unfinalized pages to sell the comic up until release. I'm not nitpicking, as you keep acting as if, if the writing can't be picked up in the panels. Seriously? Seriously? As if the writing can't be picked up in the panels? You mean like, you mean like the dialogue and such? couldn't be picked up from just my watching League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? You mean, you mean like that? You know? It, like, I should have just been able to know psychically everything that was being said in the movie, and it was going to be of that level of quality, whatever I thought it to be? But come on, what the fuck does that even mean? Did you, and, and by the way, did you purposely put quotes around writing because you remember two of the three preview pages have no writing on them? That's right. Even if he had lettered those pages and shown us the lettered pages, they wouldn't have had any writing on them. There was no dialogue on there. Uh, at most, one had a couple of sound effects, and then on the third page, there was a couple of lines of text, and that was it. So all he really showed in showing us those three pictures, in showing us these almost completely absent of writing pages, is, hey, I can tell a penciler what to draw. Well, great, you get a sticker. Here's your sticker. Good Lord. I mean, you see what he's doing, right? He's basically saying that you should be able to look at this page, or these pages, and know that the dialogue and the writing is good, because the pictures are good. Well, that's not the way it works in the real world. In the real world, you could have a completely shit writer at the helm. Luckily, we didn't, by the way. I wasn't so quite so fortunate with League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. You know, I saw the beautiful cinematography, and I thought this had to be a good movie. But when the dialogue got laid down on top of it, it was not. 
thankfully, it was not so bad when ISOM came out and I actually got to read the dialogue. Now, it's not to say that I don't that I think the dialogue was perfect. It's not to say that I didn't find a whole bunch of flaws. There's plenty of places in which I felt like there wasn't enough dialogue. There's plenty of places in which I felt like key elements of story were left out. <coughs> Names. <coughs> and, you know, there, it, it has its flaws. And that is why I will continue to maintain, as I have maintained through my entire 11 video series on ISOM number one, that people bought ISOM number one on hope, not quality. And it is also why I will be buying ISOM number two on hope, not quality, because quality has yet to be demonstrated. <sighs> Thank you for following along with my video record of this Twitter kerfuffle. Uh, I am Mike Partika. Please do subscribe to my channel, and I will talk to you later.